Welcome to Concerning the Spiritual in Art, a podcast exploring spirituality, consciousness, and the creative process. I'm your host, Martin Benson. All right, y'all, welcome back to the podcast. Today, I have Laura Payne, a visual artist based in Canada, on uh, to talk about her incredible practice. Um, Our conversation began sort of learning about how she went from being a portrait artist to then doing these kind of little line drawings on the side that ultimately ended up taking her on a whole different trajectory uh, and the path that she's on now making the work that she's currently making, which are these incredible geometric kind of, I consider them like geodes or like fourth dimensional objects that use glitter and acrylic paint and neon colors and super prismatic and super dynamic. And we had just a really beautiful conversation around creative process, around the mysteries that kind of be pulled into this, even though she works very regimentally and she kind of has a sense of real control over what she's doing. She talked a lot about how she's always trying to leave space for like spontaneity or the sort of mysterious creative component to move through her. And we kind of talked about the mysteries of the creative process itself. Um, she shared so many uh, incredible insights about not only the the paintings that she does, but also these uh, sort of new explorations and projections that she's doing or these light boxes that she's exploring. And she's just a really dynamic artist with so many incredible facets to her practice and had a lot of amazing things to share today. So I think you're going to really enjoy this episode. So here you go, Laura Payne. Hey, y'all. I'm going to cut in here real quick uh, for all my YouTube viewers out there, just to remind you that the podcast also exists on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and any major podcast platform. So if you're enjoying what you're seeing here on YouTube, go ahead and subscribe on one of those platforms as well, so you can take the show with you on the go and never really miss an episode. Also, I wanted to let you know that I'm now offering subscriptions on my Instagram page, at Martin L. Benson, for 99 cents a month. That's less than $12 a year which that funding will go toward helping produce the show. Um, So I can continue to evolve the podcast, continue to create great content. So if you support what I'm doing here and are enjoying all this content here on YouTube, consider not only subscribing on the podcast platforms, but also subscribing on Instagram for that 99 cents a month so that I can continue on this path. So thank you all. Now back to the show. Peace. All right, Laura, welcome to the podcast. How are you doing today? I'm great. How are you? Doing good. Laura's joining me all the way from uh, Canada outside of Calgary on this early Sunday morning. And uh, I'm just super excited to connect with you. I remember when I first came across your work, um, a friend of mine, Gibbs Rosenthal, shows at a gallery that you show at um, in Montreal. And I remember seeing a show he was in and then seeing your work, I think, in association with that gallery. And I was like totally drawn in immediately like followed you on Instagram and just been kind of like following you since and just really love like what you're doing, the materials you're using, the forms you're kind of crafting. They're so fascinating to me. And we're definitely going to dig in and into those and learn more about it. But I'm really interested in you as a person, as an artist and sort of your own journey and how you've sort of gotten to this space. So I'm curious, like kind of like, how did this whole process of creating art start for you? And how did your interest draw you toward these kinds of abstract geometric forms? Um, first of all, that's cool. I didn't know you knew uh, Gibbs. I haven't met Gibbs, but yeah, love his yeah, work. Yeah, you know his work. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So that's a neat connection. It's yeah. is smaller than you ever think it is. It is. It um, really is. <laughs> but um, yeah, no, I, I was trying to think of it because I figured there would be like a little bit of a, you know, where did it all start question? Um <laughs> <laughs> and it's probably a hard thing to answer you know because it's like oh well I was born on <laughs> yeah. no, no, no. I'm not gonna go like, that yeah like how yeah. this like like when when at what point did like art become a real like path for you and like how did your interest in that evolve yeah no it's a good question because like well the answer is different for everybody and I've been making art for as long as I can remember you know as a kid of course in any form I can get my hands on but I never had any um concept of being an artist professionally as a kid I didn't know Mm -hmm. that was um my parents took me to lots of art museums uh, and galleries but typically just like work that was made half a century earlier or older so I had this concept that being an artist was something that like 
people did a long long time ago but that's not a job now um and <laughs> so it's kind of weird but I was it thinking is. back to being a kid and um I I like weirdly romanticized like working in an office like I don't know why. <laughs> I just like I, I couldn't wait to be a grown-up and I think like to me like working in a cubicle and like wearing a pencil skirt was like that was the fantasy <laughs> that's, that's hilarious not what my life looks like at all now but I just I think it's because I like you know I have a certain um proclivity for liking things in order and organizing mm-hmm. things and I think that that just like fit into that idea of being like a neat and tidy not that I'm neat and tidy even <laughs> but like being a very sort of organized yeah adult uh, in the adult world and That's so funny oh my gosh <laughs> when I when I was um uh, making art in high school and and then like college um I was focusing mostly on portraiture like you mm. wouldn't maybe know that from my work now but that's what I went to grad school even doing portrait work and then about halfway through I started doing these like secret little line drawings they were secrets because they were they didn't mean anything you know they 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 weren't serious they were not serious art and so they were (laughs) just just for me and Mm -hmm. um, that was the first time in a long time I remembered making work that really felt like it was just just for me and like something that was truly tapping into something inside yeah and that evolved I somehow you know wound up showing these to a few people and that wound up being uh really the majority of what my thesis ended up being was these big line projections on top of um sort of color field painted panels uh and a few color field paintings and um and then when I moved to back to Canada I moved from Ontario to Saskatchewan which is well I moved to Saskatoon which is much further north Mm. and um, there's this whole history of modernism actually that existed through the 60s 70s 80s in uh, Saskatchewan really prominent modernists went there and talked workshops yeah like uh, Frank Stella um, I know Clement Greenberg spent some time there um, and there's this like legacy of abstraction and modernism that I just kind of like walked right into and had no idea what I was what I was um, encountering and I sort of understood that part of it had to do with like that sort of prairie I think you kind of have it you see it in the states too in like a lot of desert states there's a Mm -hmm. sort of um, minimalism modernism bent that's influenced a lot by like the atmosphere and the landscape yeah and and so I think that really formed um that was really formative for the work that I'm making now uh really interesting yeah the way the light hits certain the light the way the the late October light would you know that hot pink light would hit the sides of the buildings downtown and I Mm -hmm. wanted to paint that so I was painting that sort of thing abstract within pictorial space and then I started to get the idea like well what if it was the shape itself like what if Mm -hmm. it wasn't mind um yeah so that's that's kind of what set me on the track that's so interesting. Like, I, I wonder what the experience like, because, you know, I, I got my MFA and went through grad school and it was an amazing experience, but man, it was intense at certain points, yeah. you know, it's, uh, it's definitely was a gauntlet, but like, what was it like going in as some, sort of a portrait artist and then making the shift? Did you feel like really supported by your professors and your peers? Or did you feel like a little, like it was trepidatious, like to like, actually like put that out there? Like, how did that experience go for you? I felt extremely supported. Um, I think a lot of that was the particular program that I chose Mm -hmm. from the the outset, which was um, the Mount Royal School of Art at MICA at the Mm -hmm. Maryland College of Art in Baltimore. And I like to think of that class um, as sort of the island of misfit toys. (laughs) (laughs) Because, well, a lot of American art institutions still um, are compartmentalized by media and they had Mm -hmm. a school and they had a sculpture school and a photography school and new media and then Mount Royal was just sort of like you know maybe you're a performance artist maybe you're a sculptor maybe you're a video artist maybe you're three or four things at the same time yeah Um, and that was really uh, embraced and encouraged and so yeah I, it wasn't that difficult to transition I'm, I'm that's so great to feel supported in your art journey and I think that's what it should be but you know you hear horror stories of certain people's experiences sometimes within art educational situations where they get kind of pushed 
in directions they generally didn't want to go. And it ends up being really a tough thing to unravel. But um, I think it's amazing what you're talking about too, is like how this sort of paradigm of art, even in the educational model had shifted to embracing all mediums and approaches. And it's less about like medium specific concerns and more about like general art concerns, which I think opens the door for a lot of innovation and interesting approaches. But I think what you're doing in particular, I love how you drew this line, this through line through the modernism and especially throwing out like Frank Stella, like thinking about Frank Stella's pieces and looking at your work, like I can see all those years very different. It's kind of like a neo-futuristic kind of cosmological gem of what Stella was doing. It's kind of a different thing, but I see this through line. Um, and so I find that to be an interesting thread too, because I do see some of the concerns of modernism being reapproached in the contemporary space again by a lot of uh, painters or people who are exploring painting in new ways. Like, I think that postmodernism really was a quickly kicked the modernist sort of thinking away. And I think it's coming back and we're trying to find a way to integrate some of the, the best qualities of those things. Do you still, do you think about like, in terms of like your approach to your work, like obviously there are formal concerns, but what are your interests in these geometries that you're using? Especially I was looking at your, uh, I think it's your interpolation series mm -hmm. where you have these cubes that are sort of like intersecting with each other. And they kind yeah. of remind me of like exploded or dynamic forms of platonic solids in some ways. Like I just, I'm really <laughs> interested in like what your thoughts are in those works. Yeah, thank you. Uh, well, that that series in particular, I was interested in finding a way to visually represent the fourth dimension, like mm -hmm. not through time, um, which is one way to conceive of it, but um, having these three-dimensional forms, but that are depicted in two dimensions, um, have them intersect. They're made of different materials. They have mm -hmm. conflicting principles of realism. Like these are like one part's glowing and it should be reflecting off another surface, but it's not. And mm -hmm. there's shadows where there shouldn't be shadows. And so then not just making like a three-dimensional sculpture that represents a four-dimensional sculpture, but mm -hmm. a two-dimensional painting that represents yeah. a four-dimensional sculpture. And um, one thing I always go back to is um the really like like loving kind of a heartfelt way that Carl Sagan describes the fourth dimension mm. it's just like he could have been on Sesame Street explaining <laughs> like maybe he was even but he he demonstrates um what it's like for the t the second dimension to experience the third dimension coming into its space and so he has like a rectangle that represents mm you know a space mm -hmm. and it's a little square and that's you you're a two-dimensional square and then he takes a three-dimensional apple and he takes the base of it and stamps it onto some ink and stamps it onto the paper and that represents the three-dimensional apple starting to enter the two-dimensional mm -hmm. space and he slices a little bit of the apple off stamps it in the ink again stamps it on top of the old shape and it gets bigger and bigger and that is how the second dimension experiences the third dimension coming into its space so wow it's it was it was just really inspiring because you know these things can be really difficult to explain but he just yeah. found a really accessible um and inspiring way to to sort of share that concept yeah it's such an interesting concept because i know like you know, really advanced mathematicians and physicists can understand how to express multiple dimensions through equations and through that knowledge, but to visualize it is a totally different thing. And the way I've like thought of, I've always thinking about like these, the multiple dimensions. And I come from a place of experience where, yeah, there's definitely multiple dimensions and consciousness and the ways in which we experience ourselves relative to the cosmos, but it always is described as like a 90 degree turn. It's like you enter into another dimension. So it's like you go from a point and then you align and then you take a 90 degree. So then you have an axis this way and then you do another 90 degree, which comes out the Z or whatever. And then yeah. the fourth is like another 90 degree like, you know, I'm thinking about like the Tesseract or like um, as like a two dimensional, it's like the actual two dimensional form we're seeing is really the shadow of its fourth dimensional reality. It's like you can only see a shadow of the other dimensions. And I think that whole thing, it starts to like blow my mind open too much. That's a real I can't, <laughs> can't fully comprehend. 
But I think what you're doing is really interesting because I do see that exploration of multidimensional space within the two-dimensional surface, even though they do have a little bit of a sculptural play with them, right? Like there's not a perfectly flat painted surface, right? Are you, yeah. what kind of materials are you using to craft like the surfaces to build them? Yeah, um, I'm working in uh, acrylic and glitter. Um, yeah. So the glitter necessarily is, you know, built up to produce a, a pretty thorough layer. And then mm -hmm. when it's put away, it does, it does create a little bit of depth on the surface. And so, okay. like, you know, the tape lines end up leaving some, some residual edges. Yeah. So, yeah. So it really is mostly flat. Mm -hmm. It's just so it's hard, you know, the photographs, it's like, it's, <laughs> that's what I love. Like, you know, I can't fully experience anything until I see it in person, but like, I can get a really good idea that like, oh, this person's doing something really special and interesting just by like seeing it up close, but you still can't fully like comprehend what these objects feel like in resonance with my personal space, you know, hopefully one day I'll get to see it because oh, I yeah. do. Yeah, I'm sure I will. I'm going to find ways to see all the work of all the people that I've uh, I'm connecting with through this platform, this podcast. Um, but that's so interesting to me, like the glitter component. I, I kind of am glitter averse in certain ways and I'm growing to be more connected to it. So I live in New Orleans. This is, you'll think this is funny. Oh. I live in New Orleans. And so we have like Mardi Gras, which is like these big parades and stuff. And they're all these different crews and they have these different things. They throw off the floats. My wife rides in a, uh, the like oldest, like all female uh, crew called Muses. And their big giveaway is these glittered high heel shoes. And so she spends like weeks making these custom shoes she makes like 20 of them that she'll throw away as like special gifts to people on the parade route so we've glitter like all over the place and so I have this like aversion to it in some ways because it just gets everywhere but mm -hmm. I think the way that you're using it is so tight and neat and the way that it breaks up space is like it's so amazing because the glitter kind of for me at least the way their photograph takes on this feeling of like a dense galaxy space, you know what I mean? Because of the way the light shimmers off of it. It's almost like looking into like the most dense image of like some foreign galaxy of some kind. Does the cosmological like perspective, like does that, is that inspiring a lot of your choices in terms of like form or color too? Like how, how does that play? And you mentioned Carl Sagan. So I imagine you're interested in the cosmos a little bit, right? I, I am. Um, I do try to keep a little bit of mystery alive. No, I'm not saying that like, um, like I don't want to divulge anything. I actually mean mystery for myself. Yeah. So I, mm -hmm. I do investigate these things, but I try to keep a little bit of a surface level, um, you know, not understanding, but keep a little bit of detachment from the material because I don't want to get down too far of a rabbit hole. Yeah. A little too, cause I already have a tendency to, um, bog myself down with rules mm -hmm. um, you know, going back to talking about my childhood and, yeah, and like, right. rules and organization and order yeah. um, I like what really works well for me is is um, a, like a chaotic idea as mm -hmm. like the basis of the work and then assembling rules on top of that chaos yeah cool um, it just it results in something more dynamic and I find that if I if I investigate these things a little bit too specifically then it yeah. just it just kind of flattens everything out. You know? Yeah, it might be, li yeah, it limits, you know, it limits like what might be able to emerge from your creative process. I feel yeah. the same way. It's like, you always have to, like, I, you know, I'm, as an artist, I'm similar. Like I like to have some control. I do a lot of symmetry and geometry in the way I paint, but like, I also like outside of all that control, I always have to leave a little window of mystery of openness for like, the universe to come in and like work its magic in the space, you know, and it's like, if you try to control every factor, every variable, sometimes you do that um, at a fault because it sterilizes the work. And I think what's interesting for me about art, especially people who are working with, you know, tangible materials, making uh, work by hand, and this is nothing, no slight against the digital because that's a total, it's just a different conversation, but the imperfections that come through, the, the, the opportunity for like taking a quick leap of, you know, a change in a way you didn't expect just because you intuitively just feel it in that moment, like makes it so special and makes it so real to me, you know? And that can be a really difficult um, thing to embrace when you're, when you're, you've, you've, 
<laughs> created this whole sort of vocabulary and and yeah. like yeah set of rules for creating work um the other day i was working on some panel designs to have cut for some new paintings and i had an idea for a shape in my head and i i like you know started to draw it out i had a pers perspective point to start from and and i was like drawing up the lines and I'm, that's not quite right and <laughs> these three parts need to be the exact same length. I don't know why they just do. And, <laughs> like, and I labored over this thing for like two weeks, like on and off, not just, mm. you know, a studio of 24 hours a day or anything. Yeah. But, yeah I know what but, you, mean, you yeah. know, I, I knew well enough to walk away, come back to it with fresh eyes and work on it a little bit. And by the end, it was very, it's, it's a very nice shape. It's very pretty. And I might work with it in the future. Um, but it was, it just felt a little bit tortured. And mm -hmm. I actually, I was ready to send it off to, uh, there's a company here I have that cuts my panels for me. I was ready to, you know, send it off. And before I did, I kind of went, hmm. And I grabbed my sketch pad and I sketched out a shape really fast. And hmm. it was different. And I was like, that's it. That's the one. <laughs> yeah. That's the one I'm going to do. Yes, so yes. That took me 10 seconds. Like yes. that's so much better. It's so much more dynamic and, mm -hmm. and fluid. And I don't know what the palette's going to be yet. I don't know what, but embracing a little bit of that intuition, I think yes. is, is really important. Definitely. Yeah, that's so interesting. And it's almost like the two weeks that you were kind of working out the other shape was almost like setting the stage for this spontaneous moment of like expression. It's like you're kind of training, even though you didn't know it for that yeah. moment of when you just intuitively just cranked it out you know what I mean it's kind of interesting mysterious the way these things work but I know it, exactly what you mean from my own experience like sometimes like you can like belabor some art like that just happens to all of us like we can just overdo something overthink something and then it's when we get to that like threshold of like frustration we're ready to scrap it that sometimes something new just bursts forth like spontaneously and you're just like that's kind of for me like what keeps art so alive and interesting is those kinds of moments where you become surprised by what it is that just occurred in your studio. And it's like, that's what makes it so exciting. Sometimes it makes me think that like, I'm not doing this by myself in some way. It feels like there's something else going on that I'm not fully aware of because it's just that magical of a feeling. You kind of, I saw you lit, light up a little bit. You agree with that? <laughs> well, so it's funny because when you when you first messaged me, I wasn't sure if I was going to say this. <laughs> when you first <laughs> messaged me, um, inviting me to do this, I, I was really flattered and excited, but I was also a little surprised because I thought, oh, like he's um, seeing something that I didn't put there. I, you know what I mean? I I, I didn't really, um, I wasn't really open to understanding what you know concerning the spiritual what that really meant in my work and I didn't really think it was there mm -hmm. um and then in early in the new year I think this is a text that's already ripped through the art world in a lot of ways but a friend <laughs> recommended uh Rick Rubin's new book Are you yes familiar? yeah oh yeah and that was extremely enlightening mm -hmm. and also took a lot of the pressure off yes. of like thinking about why I'm doing what I'm doing and really allowed me to step back and reconsider. And he talks about the transmissions of ideas and how these things, you know, they can enter you or, you know, if you don't grab them, they can enter somebody else and that that's okay. Yeah. Uh, it wasn't for you at that yeah. time, exactly. but, um, but you know, there's, there's really something to that. Yeah, it is. It's just so hard to explain. It's like the rational, logical sort of side of our minds, like sometimes has trouble, like taking that leap into the intuitive, mysterious space of like what else might be occurring because um, it's scary. It's a scary space to like, think about like that. We can't fully comprehend or know like wh who it is we fully are and what it is that's actually going on on this planet with ourselves and um, I think art has always been such an important component to the human species. You've seen it since the you know dawn of civilization and, and pre-civilization. There's been this impetus to to express, to create, to leave a mark, to leave you know to leave an impression of some kind. Like, what is it about us as a species compared to all the other species on this planet that has this impulse 
to want to reach out and connect with others through the way we express ourselves or through these seemingly like, um, I mean, these images have no sort of uh, purpose for our survival, you know, on a practical fundamental level, but we tend to always lean toward them, long for them and utilize them. And so it, it does beg the question as to like, what is it about like creativity and art in general that sort of drives the human species to be where we are today? And where is it going to drive us into the future? And I think that's why art has always been so valued by culture, even the cultures that dominate other cultures, they tend, they still valued art. And so it's, it's an interesting thing to contemplate because as being an artist and playing this role, we know, I think deep down that there's some magic going on here. So they're like that moment, like, you know, when you just scribbled that shape out, what was it? What was the energy that bubbled up inside of you and pushed you to make that act happen? What is that? And I don't think we'll ever fully be able to know or put our finger on it, but we can say it's something special, something interesting, something important. And it can be really hard to listen to that intuition sometimes because we live in such a labor oriented culture that, you know, there, there's a, there's a big part of, there's a big part of me, uh, of my heart or my mind, my mind, not my heart, uh, that <laughs> wants to say, do the one that you worked harder on because it's better because you put more time into it. Mm. Um, and, and that's just not how it works. And the more of the work that's creative created with my conscious mind I think like the more prescriptive it is and mm -hmm. it's just it's missing that that that's something that whatever yeah. through, you know move through you or yeah yeah that, that intuition um there's something missing otherwise yeah it's interesting and you know also it's like we can't not every single work that comes out of our studios is going to have that quality in it be like you know you have to kind of make a bunch of work and then every now and then or every few pieces, or you know what I mean? Every so often, there's one that comes through that you're like, where did that come from? What is that telling me? And sometimes those are the pieces that are kind of pointing you to where you're headed. You know what I mean? There's kind of like these little like changes, like, for example, like looking at some of your work, like I can see some of these amazing little changes, like bringing in this like grid pattern into into some of those shapes and spaces were really interesting. I'm also really interested in some of your color choices, like, yeah. you know, the neon kind of palette, but then you also have some really like darker tones too, that really hot, make those lighter sort of more like electric colors pop even more. Like where does your like um, sort of color palettes come from in terms of inspiration, like, or what drives some of the, uh, the feelings or thoughts that go into those uh, components of your work? Well, <clears throat> and for a long time, it's still true, but for a long time, the focus was, I was really interested in that like liminal transitional color that happened between planes. And so mm -hmm. you know, these simulated light sources that hurt, that hit certain surfaces of the paintings, you know, you've got like a red light source that appears to come from one angle, but then a blue light source that comes from another one. I'm really interested in those transitional colors that happen yeah. between the angles. Um, and so sometimes they can end up being a little bit more organic because I've like sort of plucked, um, you know, color palettes from photo references. Mm. Um, but then where I do some of the more neon colors too, sometimes I like contrasting those because then they appear to come from like even more vastly different yes. planes yes. Um, of existence. Mm. And, you know, so it's, I like to work with the full range. Um, it's really hard for me to not put every single color into every single painting. <laughs> yeah. um, it's 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 you know you know <laughs> i know that feeling yeah like limiting so color delicious. palette can be tough <laughs> sometimes but i think for what you're doing the prismatic quality of them is also kind of what gives them this otherworldly other dimensional feeling to them they do feel like these like i know you might not align with this but this is just me as a as a viewer of your work these kind of like little spiritual gems of like the mystery of another space, another universe, another time. It's like almost someone brought some like geode from a totally different dimension and just like brought it into this one, you know? So like to me, there is this feeling that I get when I look at your work, even the radial pieces, like those series as well, they feel like they're almost like gifts from like another dimension that's brought down into this space to kind of, I don't know, surprise us and remind us that there's something more 
going on here. And, and that might not have anything to do with your initial intention. It's just, that's just maybe what I'm bringing to the pieces when I see them because of the, the exactness of your geometry, the precision of your execution, but also the playfulness of material, um, like all those things combined to just really create this feeling of another, of another dimension, kind of like what you're, what you're hoping for. It sounds like is to sort of express do you say the fourth dimension, but it could be the fifth dimension <laughs> who knows, like, <laughs> where these things okay. come from um, in terms of how they express themselves. So I think it's really fascinating. And I'm, I'm curious to see like how you continue to evolve them. One thing I noticed, and I haven't seen like, cause like on your website versus on your Instagram, you have some newer pieces, like the one piece that was on your Instagram, that's like a giant uh, version. Like a lot of them are very intimate in scale. Um, a lot of your pieces and some of the bigger ones are still not huge. They're not small either, but they're kind of in that middle space. Like what is it about the way you work in terms of scale that's um, important to you? It's a good question. Um, with scale, I think I try to bring in the same. Um, I don't do like a proportionate amount of detail the larger I go or I, I, I don't try to. Um, so the, the larger ones are an opportunity to like really get into the finer, mm. finer details, finer lines, and they end up feeling like it's funny. Uh, you mentioned you weren't sure what the radial ones like if I was thinking about what exactly the initial inspiration was, but I realized retroactively that I think that the sort of fourth dimension concept was a part of them as well, because mm -hmm. you could geodes and um, you could yeah. also compare them to tree rings. These are sort of like um, representations of time as yes. well. Yes, mm -hmm. exactly. Externally and, and tree rings form internally. And so when I'm working on a bigger piece, it feels like that. I mean, again, it's, it's, I'm investing a lot more time in these pieces, but um, it, they just feel, they feel older. Yeah. <laughs> way. Like, like the, it really is like the little radials. They feel like little babies. Mm -hmm. <laughs> little, yes. you know, like they're so simple and clean mm -hmm. and kind of pure. And the bigger I get, like, I don't scale them up. Are they, um, you know, to, you know, if a little, if a little radial has three layers, I don't have a, a four by four foot one that has three layers. It has yeah. 60 layers. You exactly. Know? Right. So yeah. They feel older. Yeah. That's so interesting. Yeah. Yeah. The tree ring yeah. idea, you know, like how time is expressed through those, the rings and how you're seeing that is like in relation to your work. That's so fascinating. It's also cool on those radial ones, how you create sometimes on them based on the value relationship you create this kind of like ribboning of it you know what i mean i don't know how to describe it where it like goes it wow. kind of comes back and forth in space and visual space um yeah. through the way those tones are which i think creates a really interesting effect as well but scale is such an interesting thing for us to think about as artists because it can it can create a different kind of experience with the work because sometimes the small intimate pieces really bring you into this quieter space. Like it pulls you into them. And by virtue of you moving closer, you're becoming more and more contained by the work in this more intimate space where the big ones are like almost like addressing your body. And so they're like almost yeah. like this embodiment, you know, this like bigness of like feeling. It's interesting, like how those things relate to like the body experience, you know, like being super intimate or being like kind of real broad and open. Absolutely. I always love that when I experience work. Well, and if you don't mind my, my bringing up too, um, because we're talking about my paintings, but I did a like a projection installation earlier this year at a public gallery that was a combination of my paintings cool. and my light work. So it was a radial piece that was six by six feet. Uh, and it was projected with these sort of concentric opening and closing rings over top. Um, nice. And it was definitely meant to have the same impact of like kind of like a portal like enveloping of the body like mm -hmm. just, um, and and it was always it's really interesting. Um, I'm always the most interested to see kids respond um, right respond to these works too, and adults are so polite. They're so polite in <laughs> art galleries. They come and you know they they have their hands behind their back like yeah. and they kind of walk around it and they you know I think they're like people are people feel like they have to spend a certain amount of time looking at painting or it's rude kids yeah. just in and they like put their hand up in front of the projector and <laughs> are just sort of like 
what's under there you know like <laughs> and they're allowed to touch it yeah um, I'm fine with that and so I just I really like watching them engage with the piece and mm-hmm. like yeah, kids just have the most interesting they haven't learned how to read art yet so they have the best yes um, it's just very natural it's very just intuitive it's like they um and they're and they're not like overthinking things like we do as adults because we've been given so many concepts over time and we have a certain rigidity to the logical frameworks of how we can understand certain things and they don't have that rigidity there's a fluidity to the way their minds are and like i see that like just uh you know with my especially with my five-year-old like it's just like the, his mind is just so malleable. It's so open. It's so spontaneous. And um, the way he sees art is so beautiful too, because it's like, he doesn't feel like he needs to like know the answers to anything. You know what I mean? I feel like sometimes that's a big uh, hang up for people when they go to museums or galleries and they see work that's very challenging to what they're normal, normally used to seeing they feel like there is an answer that they're not getting. And so sometimes it can make people feel stupid or, you know, push people away because they feel like there has to be like an answer, but like, that's the actually opposite of what I feel art is about. Art is not about answers at all. It's about this relationship between you and this experience that someone else put time into creating. And it's about understanding what's happening internally. What questions is it, is it deriving from you? What feelings does it put in your body? What kind of mood does it put you in? Like, what does, you know what I mean? Like, instead of like trying to like have a, a perfect answer to what the work means, I think that's a, that's a, that's a bad road to go down when it comes to experiencing art. You know, you got to have this openness about it. That's yeah. what makes it fun to me. That's what makes it fascinating, especially when you go with people who you like really connect with. Like I love going to galleries or like museums, like, you know, with my wife and I go to a ton of them and we love to just talk about the work and have great conversations, you know, or with friends. I think that sometimes that's the value too. It's like, it can just spark a great interaction with other people in relation to the work. It's super cool. I think yeah. there's a special component to it. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. And so these projections, is this a new thing for you to explore? Um, it's, it's something that I've kind of done separately from my painting practice for a long time. And I, I like that body of work because, um, you know, it's, uh, it's not so object oriented. Like it's, it's just more of like a temporary installation and, um, yeah, the light projections were something I was doing in grad school. And I, I've also worked with some light boxes as well, but this oh. was just a really cool new opportunity to like merge those two bodies of work. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure if it'll happen again, but you know, might happen in a new form. Yeah. I mean, I think it's a dynamic way to like play with what you're doing in your studio practice create kind of like a, uh, an experimental experience, you know, and that relates to what you're interested in and who knows what kind of spaces you could like take over. You know, I think with the projection mapping and with uh, the kind of rendering you can do digitally now, and then how you can relate them with physical space and object has incredible possibilities. I even saw like, I don't know if you saw like the Apple releasing their vision pro thing. And I'm like, I have my feelings oh. about VR and, or <laughs> what do they call it? Uh, a, a augmented reality. Augmented now. reality. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Which is cool. I mean, I, I, I don't know, but like, I think you can create these like really trippy experiences in these spaces using, uh, you know, like after effects or all these digital programs as well. I don't think there needs to be one way of doing anything necessarily. No. And it's always cool to see artists like stretch outside their comfort zone, try new materials, try a new thing because at the end of the day it's just going to help keep your I think your process very rich yeah I I completely agree and the 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 nice thing too about the projection work is that it is like a little bit more literal like the time-based work Mm -hmm. um a little bit more space-based because some of these pieces you know like my light boxes I use um some dichroic films and so the pieces are are moving they're programmed to change color Mm -hmm. and then depending on your orientation in space different colors come through the film Mm. um so like it's sort of three four dimensional in that respect too yeah Yeah. because like your your position changes the experience just on like where you're standing in space which is and your time encountering this the piece as Mm -hmm. well yeah 
No, I think all those things are really interesting. And I love how that kind of ties in to your work, this idea of like alternate dimensions or expressing these different sort of components of reality that we're not fully like in touch with. I think it's such an amazing space to explore. And I think as we get more and more into this, who knows where we're headed in this technological future that seems to be burgeoning faster and faster year after year, but our understanding of of the cosmos, our understanding of quantum physics and all these things is really changing the way we understand our relationship to time itself. Um, and so I think those things will always be sort of an interesting th place to explore as artists because they're like new fields of understanding. And I think whenever you look at art history, you look at science or like sort of like what was the base knowledge of that time. You look at what the artists were doing. It almost seems like they're doing this. Like one goes here, then one goes there. You know what I mean? It's like yeah. one goes a little further and then the other one passes it. And then, then the artists pass them. And it's almost, there is a relationship between the arts and science. And I, I, I'm so saddened that uh, over many decades, it seemed to have been separated, but I think a lot more people are seeing them come back together, which is really cool. I'm curious too um, about your perspective. Somebody has who has, um, from what I can tell, like a really rich spiritual um, practice and, and life. Um, do you feel like your art and your spiritual practice are one and the same, or can you do you separate them at all? Um, they definitely are, and um, I think for me, like spirituality is not like um, something that is just limited to a certain place or a certain day of the week or a certain time of day. I see it as literally permeating every moment of existence. So every action that takes place in life, if it comes from this consciousness of of this kind of understanding of interconnectedness of oneness then what comes forth will have a spiritual energy to it because you're you're living in this awareness that like you are not separate from everything even though it feels that way at times like there's an understanding that underneath the layers and surface of reality there is this interconnected web that we're all a part of and so for me my art practice has become more and more that way it wasn't always that way because i didn't always have that feeling you know I always felt like the spirituality was on meditating on the cushion which it is but it's also in the kitchen it's also in the car it's also right here right now you know it's everywhere all the time and so now that I'm becoming more and more like in touch with that in my own way like when I'm making work like I'm just trying to like live in that resonance of of interconnectedness and and I always have that prayer in my heart that like whatever is coming through and whatever is happening here is going to create ripples of positivity and love in the world and insight and help someone somewhere on their journey in some way and that's how I kind of keep it rich and keep it alive but that's just sort of how I frame it you know mm -hmm. um it's it's really mysterious to me I just feel like at the end of the day like I can't deny the fact that like I am not actually separate from anything even though I'm living this life as Martin in this body that has these these perceived boundaries but I've had experience in my life where these boundaries are actually not they're not as real as I thought they were you yeah. know um even though sometimes I I still get caught up in all the all the shit you know but like <laughs> I try to always remember there's something grander connecting all of us this this space this dimension of pure interconnectedness pure oneness that is sort of the under under girdle of everything and um I try to tap into that but it's hard it's really hard this world is so crazy you know it is, yeah. and my desires and my faults as a human like pull me into the mud all the time but like I just try to keep a light heart about it because I think there's no perfect person and there never will be and that's the beauty I think of of this world we live in you know it's like we're all just trying our best to figure out how we can be authentic in the way we live um I really like what you just said about um like living in the residence mm -hmm. of spirituality like you you might be occupying different like levels or different depths of your mm -hmm. spirituality at different times depending on how concentrated you are exactly it's really important and um yeah it, it feeds into that whatever that thing is whatever that like yeah. intuition that spirit part of your art your your creative act your creative yeah. process and um it's interesting I'm married to a scientist and I think that 
a lot of people think of the sciences as being very prescriptive and strict and rigid, but they're actually, it's actually a lot about discovery. Mm-hmm. And if I approach art making the way that a scientist does, a scientist is not setting out to prove something. Mm-hmm. Just like I shouldn't be setting out to make this painting exactly as it is in my head. Mm-hmm. Um, scientists set out to discover. Exactly. To explore. Yep. And that's what we should be doing in our practice. Definitely. I mean, you're so right. Like I think science, science, the scientific process in and of itself is a spiritual practice when it's done in the most authentic way, because it is coming from this place of openness, curious and curiosity, but also of like being honest. It's like the honesty of a real scientist to like take what the data is telling them and not trying to force it to be something it's not. Um, And that's something that's so important, you know, like you mentioned Carl Sagan earlier. And every time I hear Carl Sagan talk or hear a quote from Carl Sagan, like that man was deeply spiritual. Just spiritual is a word. It doesn't actually mean anything. It's pointing to space, but it's not the space itself, you know, and I think a lot of times people conflate the words with the actual experience or the thing it's pointing to. Um, and so when I hear him talk like there, there's a deep spirituality in science, a deep sense of awe and reverence for like this mystery and and this desire to figure it out, to understand it more deeply. And I think on some fundamental level, that's what all spiritual traditions are trying to help people do is to understand themselves on the deepest level. And you can't understand yourself if you don't understand the environment, you can't understand the environment if you don't understand yourself. So it's like, you need you need both, you know, at the same time. So um, I totally agree with you. I think what we do as artists is scientific in its own way. It's not, you know, not like prescriptive all the time, but like we are trying things out, seeing if they work and seeing the results. And then we either say those are the results uh, that can continue to work for us. or we have to try a new thing, you know, like there is that experimentation. And I think that's also what keeps us engaged you know I think that's probably um one of the hardest things for us as artists that I would imagine is to stay with it for the long haul um a lot of artists get burnt out um and I don't know why particularly I have my ideas of potential potentially why people get burnt out um but I think it's in some sense maybe has to do with a lack of curiosity or a lack of like deep interest in what they're doing. They just become cogs and machines and make the same thing um, a million times. Um, And so it's, that's, what's tough. Like I look at being an artist, you probably do too. It's a life path. This is just a path in your life. And this is going to teach you what it is you're here to learn. Um, And so I pray that I can continue to tread that path. And I hope you do as well, because the work you're making is just so, interesting and so fabulous and i just can't wait to see like the continued evolution of like how these things will um continue to grow for you um do you have an idea of like sort of where the next body of work might be going i know you talked about the projections the new thing but like in terms of these because you kind of work on multiple bodies of work at once at least the radial and the interpolation are they like current bodies of work that you're exploring I do I I don't um I never I realize I never have a point where I like wrap up a body of work um because I don't even think the body of work is consistent all the way through and as you might notice I hate titling my work so I just (laughs) radial I think I'm up to 115 now you know yeah and and this one is so different like shape wise and color wise to me anyway yeah um, very first one in the series um but yeah I like to move back and forth and I'm actually revisiting some of my earliest shapes because I think that they had dynamism and an energy in them through their sort of kind of like more rudimentary like a little bit cruder form Mm -hmm. Um, building that structure that really regimented structure that I that I can't help myself but build onto my paintings having to do that on um like a little bit of a more chaotic form is a lot more exciting to me at this point yeah it's so interesting I mean the possibilities for what you're doing are infinite in terms of your color choices your materials as you I feel like as you continue to explore the um you do the glitter and the acrylic like what happens if you bring in another kind of material 
Yeah. You just bring in a, no, a new variable, but doing the same thing. So I feel like you have so much territory to explore. But I love what you said about revisiting old work. I feel like sometimes our practice is like a spiral, right? It like comes yeah. back around. It's obviously at a new place. It's at a new height, but yeah. it's coming back around to the same point, you know, every now and then. And that's a cool feeling too. Absolutely. I'm also working on a series of light boxes right now that have like these um pixelated surfaces and so I have like again I, I just I can't help myself I construct these like rules they're they, <laughs> they're arbitrary but they feel right so that's kind of where the intuition comes in like yeah. six colors and you know this color is going to have 12 pixels in this composition and this one's going to have eight and this one's going to have four and and it'll you know kind yes. of like pop out and I have these um RGB LEDs underneath the surface that are kind of flexing at different speeds cool. and I've had a few artists look at them with me once I've, I've created kind of like a rough version of them and I've gotten similar feedback that they sort of feel like language like mm. it feels like there's something being communicated through these pixels through this animation there's like almost like a cryptic text that is interesting kind of the composition so I think that's something I'm really interested in, in exploring as well not to mention there's like a little bit of a stained glass reference and like stained glass has you know so much history yes. to spirituality yeah uh, architecture like there's 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 a lot of ways to go with it so oh yeah. man yeah well that's exciting it sounds like you have like a really strong practice and a very devoted practice, which is what you need in order to continue to be this channel of this kind of work that you're bringing into the world, which is, is so exciting to see. I love how you said like the paint, the, the, this, these light boxes are like a language or like speaking to you and communicating <laughs> to you, um, which they're doing anyway, but now they're doing it maybe more dynamically or directly um, through that work. Well, I think that's all just so special to see. And I can't wait to continue to like watch as your work evolves and um, you know, following you on Instagram. Everybody out there who's listening, you have to follow Laura on Instagram. I'll have all the links in the show notes. So make sure you stay uh, connected with her and the amazing work coming out of her studio in uh, Canada. And uh, hopefully, like I said earlier, I really hope I get to see some of these pieces in person because I can't imagine what they feel like when you're actually in front of them. But thank you so much for spending time with me today. I feel thank like we had an awesome conversation and learned some really amazing things about all the uh, magical stuff you're doing there, uh, bringing these other dimensional uh, spaces into the 3D. So keep it up, all right? Likewise. <laughs> all right, we'll talk soon. See you, Laura. Yeah. Thank you all so much for tuning into this episode of Concerning the Spiritual and Art. If you like what we're doing here, go ahead and hit that subscribe button so you can stay in touch and in tune with all the amazing offerings that we're going to be uh, bringing to this channel. Um, thanks again for all your support. Super grateful and uh, yeah, excited to uh, bring more content your way. Peace, y'all.